Hey, back. Wave. Waving. So thanks for joining us today, and welcome to the Equipment for Efficient Recycling Operations webinar. This is a college and university recycling coalition webinar sponsored by Alcoa and Keep America Beautiful. My name is BJ Tipton, and I'm the program manager for UNC Chapel Hill's Office of Waste Reduction and Recycling. Also joining me on the line is Keep America Beautiful's Caitlin Kiernan. She's waving, who will be helping me field questions. All of your lines have been muted, but you can submit questions to us at any time via the question panel on the right side of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible during the session. And um, now for a bit of information about who we are. Kirk is a membership-based nonprofit organization made up of campus recycling professionals seeking to exchange technical knowledge and best practices on recycling and waste reduction programs between institutions of higher learning. This webinar is part of our free Kirk Technical Webinar Series. We host these webinars every other month. The next session is scheduled to take place on June 2nd. The topic will be social marketing and behavior change. You can find more information about the Kirk Webinar Series by going to the Kirk website at www.curc3r.org. I'm very excited to be joined by a great panel of speakers today. They include Nessa Stone, who's the Recycling Operations Manager for NC State University, Roger Gazowski the, with Five Colleges Recycling, he's the manager there, and Carrie Stanford, Stanford, sorry, Senior Engineer at Resource Recycling Systems. I'm going to provide a more detailed introduction of each speaker prior to the presentation. And while we will we do want you to submit questions throughout the session. At the end of each presenter's presentation, at the very end of all of them, we're going to open it up to questions, and all speakers will be on the line at the same time, and they will be fielding your questions that way. Um, before we begin, Caitlin's going to provide some housekeeping notes. Thanks, BJ. Let me quickly go through a few details about today's webinar. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you can call GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. That's 800-263-6317. Because of the audience size, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. To ask a question, simply click the plus sign next to the word question on your control panel. Type in your question and click send. If you don't see the question box on your control panel, try clicking on the tools menu on the top of the panel. Then check the question selection. You can type in a question at any time during the presentation. We'll be sure to get back to you if you have a question that we're not able to address during the program. Any other concerns can be addressed by using the chat function, which is at the bottom of your control panel. Click on the plus sign, type in your chat message, and make sure to send it to the appropriate person by using the pull-down menu at the bottom of the pane. We will be placing a recording of the webinar on the Kirk site in the coming week so you can review the session or share it with your colleagues. Now let's start the web webinar. BJ? Thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. I, first, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their time and energy volunteering to present for us today. And just to review what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about equipment, efficiencies, and recycling operations. So this session is geared for schools of all sizes, all types, um, permanent staff, temporary staff, anything. And the speakers today, while planning the session, they wanted to make sure that they addressed that all schools are different, not only in where they're located, how close they are to markets, how um, their size, their funding, but also in what stage of the program growth they might be in. So they're going to try to address not only show you pictures and talk about equipment, but what questions you might need to ask or things you might need to think, be thinking about as you decide what equipment you're going to use. So our first speaker today is Nessa Stone. Nessa oversees all operational aspects for the waste, re waste reduction and recycling at North Carolina State University, including major equipment purchases, supervision of the recycling of solid waste crews, and development of new programs. She sets up and maintains all campus collection routes which consists of about 300 trash, cardboard, and autoclave dumpsters, more than 4,000 indoor-outdoor recycling bins. And NESA establishes new programs to, to support campus sustainability and recycling efforts, such as the Pack and Go program. 
NESA will show us how to, they moved from an antiquated collection system to a new one using a, a multi-use truck and some other things. Okay, NESA. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, this, this is NESA. Thanks for everyone for attending today. Um, BJ asked me to give basically a case history for NC State University's recycling program. And the university actually has an extremely long history of recycling um, that leads back to the 1970s. So I didn't have a picture from the program at the 1970s, so that's what my disco, disco ball is for. But um, NC State University's physical plant adopted a recycling program that captured cardboard, paper, glass, aluminum, and the primary focus was cardboard-based because of its market value as a commodity. Um, the Reclamation Center con combined a conveyor belt system with hand sorting, hand picking off a recycling line with an existing municipal solid waste transfer station at the same facility. Um, the premise of the program in the 1970s was to unload all waste onto a conveyor line system, hand pick the valuable commodities, for recycling sales, and then use the revenue to support the program. All materials were collected in dumpsters on campus. There were no recycling bins or source separation of materials for recycling. And this is a picture of the transfer station, and in the background you can see the reclamation warehouse. These were taken later, but just to give you an idea, uh, drop bottom dumpsters were used, individually transported and used uh, in the process. They were transported to the reclamation facility, dumped onto a conveyor line, and the designated recyclable materials were handpicked from all the other ways. So everything was mixed together and they were trying to pull the recycling out of all the general waste. At the end of the line, all remaining waste were compacted into a transfer trailer and hauled to the Wake County landfill. Um, the Reclamation Center sorting operations continued until about 1988, so they operated that reclamation facility for about 10 to 15, 10 to 15 years. Um, and we do not have any real diversion rates for this period of time, but they did uh, discontinue the operation due to high cost of operations and low efficiencies. The drop bottom dumpster transport system continued actually to be in existence until about 2001 through 2003. So that system stayed on campus for a really long time. And in the 1980s and 90s, source segregation and collection of recyclable materials started to replace the reclamation center and hand sorting operations. The university began curbside recycling programs at residence halls and select academic buildings. Um, if generators wanted to recycle, they were responsible for transporting their materials to one of the outdoor locations for collections. Waste and cardboard were collected inside the buildings by housekeepers and transported to dumpsters. At most buildings, cardboard was left on the ground for pickup by a recycling staff. From the late 80s through the early 90s, the recycling collections program had little operational change. Recycled materials collections expanded along with commodity demand to include more paper and plastics. And by the middle 1990s, recycling serviced 69 buildings, 17 central sites on a biweekly basis, and 16 outdoor recycling convenience sites, and 43 cardboard dumpsters. Um, manual collections for recycling were the primary focus during this time. A small staff and pickup trucks were used to collect recyclable materials from the designated locations. Recycling was transported back to the recycling warehouse and hand sorted into Gaylords for further transport to market. So there was a lot of handling in uh, this process. The collections process was time consuming, time consuming and really required multiple layers of manual labor and transport before it actually reached market. So then we lead into the uh, 2000s, the early 2000s, and that's about when I arrived at the university. Um, over the years, collection locations and staff 
expanded to meet increased demand for services and growth of the university. However, little investment was made toward the purchase of a replacement or updated equipment or to improve the efficiency in the collections. Um, and again, by the time I got here, planning, scheduling, organization, accountability had really diminished in the university solid waste and recycling services. So in 2002, the university solid waste management uh, services were reorganized into waste reduction and recycling. Um, new management and supervision began to prioritize collections, operations, equipment upgrades, and then program development. Really the first uh, major step in this process was to upgrade the solid waste system because we were using an existing transfer station, trucks, compaction equipment that had been in existence probably since the early 1970s, so it was like 35, 40 years old when I got here and really falling apart and actually quite dangerous for the operators to use. Um, a solid waste collections efficiency study was completed by an outside engineering firm and determined that the university would update all solid waste and cardboard collections equipment. The university would continue to provide services with in-house staff and university-owned equipment. So um, major capital investments were made to replace all the equipment and dumpsters for collection by front-end loading self-contained compaction trucks. And the old transfer station was actually closed at that point. As solid waste collections improved, the recycling collections programs also needed expansion and efficiency. The recycling collection staff and equipment were inadequate to meet the university's growing requests for service. Availability of recycling bins inside buildings was minimal and partic participation was low. Student, faculty, and staff requests for more recycling bins on campus and to expand the recycling programs was very high at this time. The first recycling program expansions included desk side paper recycling collections by housekeeping and updating the outdoor recycling containers to roll carts instead of um, tubs or dumpsters or basically anything that they could find to put recycling in at that time. So that was kind of our first step towards automation was to uh, invest in the purchase for, of roll carts for outdoors. And a comprehensive plan was approved to expand indoor recycling in academic and office buildings throughout campus. The simple goal for indoor recycling was to create centralized recycling collection stations inside every building. And the sites would be uniform in appearance and placed in common areas so they were easy to find and accessible to all building occupants. Prior to that, indoor placements had been made strictly by request of building occupants. And most of them were in copy rooms or smaller areas that they were not accessible to the general campus public. Recycling programs were defined and paired with education and outreach to the campus community. As efficiency and dependability of collections operations improved, campus community support for recycling initiatives further reinforced the need for strong education and stronger customer service in our group. So once the university had implementation of new indoor collection systems underway, automation of equipment and delivery to market was the next phase in efficiency of operations. The university moved forward with the purchase of automated curbside collection equipment for recycling. The equipment would be university owned, operated by in-house staff, and materials direct hauled to market for recycling. The most important function of the equipment was to incorporate automated recycling collections and haul materials directly to market. But I love trucks, so I'll say I wanted more. Um, when we started to look at this equipment for automation, we also wanted to include and incorporate roll-off collections and hauling services into the operation. The equipment and truck chosen was kind of unconventional, but multifunctional. And basically, the multifunctional purpose was swapping bodies on the chassis. And so the truck is actually named the Swap Loader SL240. So the automated uh, 
recycling collections equipment chosen did not really fit the mold of standard curbside collection trucks like used in most municipal operations. The recycling body is a modified roll-off container fitted with hydraulics and cart tippers. The body has two chambers for sorting but does not compact. We operate dual stream collections on campus for mixed paper and mixed bottles and cans. Cardboard is collected separately in dumpsters. And upon collection, materials are hauled directly to market. And NCSU is very fortunate to have multiple reliable markets in very close proximity to our campus. So that actually was really a big factor in deciding that we could get away with not having compaction on this truck. Okay, so some of the other uses for the truck is for roll-off and hauling. Um, the truck and swap loader equipment gives us the ability to haul and service our own roll-off containers. The containers are 17 to 20 cubic yard capacity, smaller than those, u those used by most large contractors. Roll-offs are available to campus customers as a billable service and used by facilities operations on job sites. Construction projects and large events uh, like move out, for example, do not use our containers. Those are uh, hired out through a vendor or a contractor. And by utilizing this truck, we were also able to uh, bring another collection stream in-house, and that was our bulk materials convenience collection site. The bulk materials drop-off site is available to frequent generators of bulk waste and recycling. It operates Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., and it's open to all departments at no charge. We accept pickup truck size loads of material at this site. Um, accepted items would be scrap metal, white goods, tires, batteries, construction and demolition debris, yard waste, wood waste, and bulk landfill items. And some people may ask, well, why do you have the site? Um, basically, we kind of operate it like a municipal convenience drop-off site for, for a city. Um, it basically helps preserve our existing compaction trucks, waste disposal trucks, and it increases our recycling rates. Um, before the materials, before we had the site available to all of campus, dumpster areas, service areas were often loaded down with pallets and tires and broken furniture, things that people didn't know what to do with. So now this gives them a viable option to bring those materials to us and then we take care of it and manage it from there. Um, before the site was established, we did have roll-offs on campus for certain materials such as scrap metal, white goods, and C&D debris. Um, this was a contracted service and it was very high cost to the university and offered little flexibility or room for expansion of that program. So one thing I'd like to mention as part of in-house collections, you actually you have to have a crew, a collections crew uh, with equipment operators and you know like general utility workers that actually go out and do the work for you. And this is a little more time and investment than the contractor end of the story. So you get the people portion of the the equation that you have to deal with also on a more individual and and one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so really, the recycling program is defined by the people of the collections crew and their desire to fulfill roles and responsibilities. Collections crews, crews um, need to be informed, they need to be accountable, well-trained, and that makes them more productive to do their work. Um, some of the things we focus on with our crews are communication, um, organization, training. We do a lot of technical training, safety training. And we try to take them on tours of MRFs and landfill facilities so they understand all this material that they're collecting, where it actually goes. And then, of course, there's the accountability customer service factor that is really important when you have your own crews doing this labor. So one of the other benefits of in-house collections, um, besides you get to really have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your crew, is that you get feedback from your customers, the crews, the markets, everything is directly back to you. So, you know, there's there's no pointing to a contractor for a problem. You know, everything comes back to your office and it's your responsibility to manage that. 
Um, another great thing is you have freedom to make changes in schedules, locations, frequency, you know, what type of containers you're using. So those are all benefits that if you're working through a contracted system that, that you'd have to uh, wait or not be able to make the adjustments as quickly. And then again, um, during normal operation hours, we always have a staff available and we can respond to questions, situations, problems in a much more positive manner, I think, than let's wait and see what happens. And for NC State University, some of the things we have next in our program expansion ideas um, is composting. We've currently started composting at the dining halls on campus. Uh, we are expanding our walkway recycling program so that we're trying to go back and revisit where all the uh, receptacles are on the walkways on campus and pair them with recycling. We have a special events recycling program that we're trying to include composting in and make more available to the campus. And then, of course, all the athletic venues, we're really trying to work with them to um, incorporate green practices into their cleaning activities and into their tailgating activities. We have an existing program called We Recycle that's been really successful at Carter-Finley Stadium for the tailgating events. And then, of course, um, program expansion always includes change. So everything I've just talked about was a long period of change. And so we're constantly evaluating our operational efficiency and adjusting change where needed and um, you know, trying to basically save money and do the best job we possibly can all at the same time. And that is it for me. Again, my name is Nessa Stone, and if you have any questions, there is my contact information. You're welcome to call me at any time. And I'm going to turn it back over to BJ. Thank you. Thanks, Nessa. You guys can see why I'm such a big fan of Nessa's. I love what she does with equipment, and I love that she loves trucks, because I don't. So thanks, Nessa. That was a great tour. Our next speaker is Roger Gazowski. Roger spent more than 20 years in the college and university recycling field, seeing it as both a student and a staff. Roger's managed, Roger has managed award-winning recycling programs in both Massachusetts and California at larger public universities, smaller private colleges, and both residential and commuter campuses. Roger was a founding member of the college and university recycling councils for both mass recycle and the National Recycling Coalition. He served as co-chair and vice-chair of both organizations, respectively. He's managed programs for five colleges, Inc., a consortium of schools in Mass and California State University in Sacramento. He's particularly sensitive to making sure that this, the discussion about equipment keeps small schools and schools with few resources in mind. OK, Roger. Hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, before we go too far, and it's something BJ touched on earlier, um, if you're just starting or expanding a program, I, I want to make sure if you get nothing else out of this presentation that you think through this first slide a little bit, that every program really goes through three stages. There's the initial pilot program, um, where after you've advocated for a program for a while, someone says, yes, go ahead. Um, then after a while, you typically get a little bit of money to either sustain that program or take the next step. And eventually, hopefully, you integrate that into part of your overall waste management and daily operations to your campus. The thing I've seen far too often is schools get stuck in that middle phase. Um, and 10 years later, 20 years later, they're still running essentially a pilot program operation. It's extremely labor intensive. Um, it's fairly inefficient. So what I'd encourage people to think about is what do you want the program to look like when you're done? and start adding those pieces a little bit at a time um, with an eye towards that end part of the program. There's really two parts that you're talking about when you talk about recycling collections. Um, you, you're really talking about collecting the material on campus and how you're getting it to that first step in the marketing process. So some people are fortunate enough to go directly to an end market. Most of us are going to some kind of broker um, in between or transfer station in between. But there's really two parts of that, and I'd encourage people to think about that when you're looking at equipment or investing, because um, there's really three ways to do that. You can have campus crews that do both the collection and the transferring of stuff to market. Um, you can outsource to a contracted hauler who does both the collection and the transfer. 
or you can look at a hybrid system um, that would actually take a, a campus collection crew and all the advantages that come with having an on-campus crew that can do special collections at the 11th hour, um, but then put it in some sort of transfer on-campus consolidation point where a contracted hauler is taking it off the market so that your crews stay on campus. And especially if you're going a little ways to market, I'd encourage people to think about that um, because that way it keeps your folks on campus and working and you don't lose them off campus anywhere where you don't have control over things. The other thing I'd encourage people to think about is there's some, some real questions you have to ask yourself before you invest in equipment or especially collection systems. Um, the biggest one is going to be who's doing the collection. If you're talking about using larger trucks, you're going to need a commercially licensed driver. Um, if you if you're buying a truck, you need to keep that truck in operation. So, is your route large enough to justify that a dedicated truck, or do you need something like Nessus, where you have a swap body that can swap out and perform multiple functions, um, or, or some other kind of box truck or something else that can for, perform multiple functions? And ultimately, how far are you from the mill or the processing center that's going to take that material? Because all of those things are going to impact what type of equipment you end up buying. Another big thing to consider is maintenance um, and repairing of equipment. That's something, there's some phenomenal equipment out there on the market, but I'd encourage people to stop and think about who's going to actually repair it if something goes wrong. And that's one of the pieces that I think people miss. Um, if you're talking about campus crews repairing it, if you've got a garage on campus, if you've got an electrician on campus doing it, what's, what are you pulling them away from? What else can't they do by repairing that equipment? And if you're outsourcing that, what kind of cost are you looking at? Um, and put that into your budget projections. Are there local folks who can maintain that equipment? Or are you talking about having to bring somebody in from across the country to fix something if it goes wrong? Think about what the downtime for that equipment is. There's a lot of equipment out there. Um, there's a lot of different ranges of investment. And I'd really encourage you to ask around to folks who have used equipment before investing in stuff to make sure that You've got something that's going to hold up under the kind of use you're looking at using it for. And, and then the other piece I'd really encourage people to think about is what's your backup plan? If something goes down, if a piece of equipment breaks, um, if it's going to be down for a couple of days, how are you going to continue to operate? And that's one of the advantages to think about contracting out services is if you don't have enough equipment in your fleet to handle that collection during the downtime, I'd at least encourage people to think about a backup contract with a hauler to do that that pickup. Um, if not, think about maybe outsourcing altogether because that's one of the real pieces that I've seen is you see you go back to the idea of using um, people picking up pickup truck loads of bags and it's just incredibly inefficient. And if that's going to happen for a while, that can be a problem for some programs. Some other things that I'd really encourage people to think about, one of the biggest ones is worker safety. So Nessa showed some in hers, I'll show some in some subsequent pieces of equipment. Think about things that don't require manual lifting. Um, we, within both five colleges and at Sac State, managed to justify a lot of investments based on nothing more than worker safety. All it takes is a couple of back injuries, and you can pay off a piece of equipment fairly quickly. So um, really think about who's going to do the collection and how they're going to do that. Um, what sort of installation costs are you looking at? Do you have that existing infrastructure on site, or are you going to have to bring it in? Because that impacts what kind of equipment you can put on a site. Mess and aesthetics concerns, for, I think it's an issue for every campus, for some campuses more than others. Um, how something looks, if your grounds is tied into how you attract and retain students, then people are going to be extremely particular about what stuff looks like on those grounds. And that's something you really have to start thinking about. The other thing to think about is access around campus. Um, can you get a truck into some of these places? One of the things that we see at the smaller colleges I'm working with now Literally, our access paths are 150-year-old donkey paths. And I wish I was making that up, but quite literally, that's our access to some of our buildings. Um, and over the years, we've paved those donkey paths, but they're not things where you're going to get a modern front-load truck into. Um, you're not going to put a 40-yard compactor next to some of our buildings. So you have to adjust a collection program accordingly, depending on what your campus infrastructure looks like. So one of the things I want to show people a little bit is one, what one of those options looked like for Amherst and Smith College. We actually, like Nessa, um, at the time we purchased this equipment about 10, 12 years ago, there wasn't anything on the market, so we had to custom design this. Um, right now, we have collection crews that go through the buildings. We use toter carts. It's the, I really like the 
Toter caster carts that have the two small front wheels that don't require any tipping of that cart to wheel it through the building. So our custodial staff will actually take that cart, wheel it right through the building as their collection barrel, um, wheel that outside, and then we put a small little custom recycling truck together. So that truck is about the size of a small box truck. It's actually a custom-built stake body truck that has a hydraulic cart tipper added to it. Um, and then you can dump that entire contents of a bin. If you're talking about paper, you're talking about 100 to 300 pounds of paper being dumped all at once in about a 60-second cycle um, or less. That is a lot more efficient than our old system where we were taking and lugging bags out of a building a couple at a time, throwing them into the back of a box truck, taking it back down to a roll-off container and dumping it somewhere. Um, this whole operation goes in fractions of a second. The other thing I really like about this style of truck is that we get to utilize the full truck. One of the problems that we run into when we use a box truck to cart those types of containers is there's an awful lot of headspace in that truck that you don't ever utilize. That You fill the container, the 90-gallon cart, to where it's full, but then you've got almost a third to a half the truck that you're carting airspace back and forth, and that's not the most efficient system for a lot of folks. So with this, we get to fill the container or fill the truck all the way top to bottom um, and dump that entire truck all at once, e either at a recycling facility or at a roll-off container on campus. And that on-campus consolidation site, in some cases, is a fairly simple process. Um, we've got a roll-off container backed up to a small tip wall. And as long as you've got that grade separation, they can handle that, the weight of that truck. It works pretty well for us. Um, and then from there, that roll-off container is carted away to a private market. So if you are looking at doing anything like that, we had our truck. It was custom-built by Bart Truck in West Springfield. Um, and it was, again, a standard stake body truck that Perkins Manufacturing put a couple of custom lifts on. Um, and it worked out very, very well for us. Since then, there's a couple of uh, off-the-rack options similarly. Um, New Way makes them, Wayne makes them, Hall All makes them. So there's a couple of things out there. Um, in this case, there's a, a new way truck from Harvard that's dumping carts with a Bane lifter. Um, so there's a couple of different lifter manufacturers, there's a couple of different truck manufacturers, and you can find the option that works best for you. The other thing to think about is if a roll-off container is not the right option for you, if you don't have a facility to transfer stuff, there are a couple other options. Compactors are always an easy way to do that, and you can put a funnel hopper on the top that you see there in the top picture. That will basically just make sure that load channels down into the compactor well. Um, and one option that I was very intrigued to see is Harvard will actually do a truck-to-truck -truck transfer. Um, so nothing is dropping on the ground. They're backing up from one truck to another um, and dumping from a smaller truck into a larger truck. So that may be an intriguing option for you if you're looking at doing something like that and don't want to dedicate a transfer site. The other thing I think people really can get some advantage of is compacting um, on site. So instead of using dumpsters on site, actually putting in a centralized compactor, it tends to work best with larger centralized sites. So if you have a what I always think of as a community college kind of campus layout, um, a lot of state universities have this sort of layout. It works very well where you have larger consolidated buildings aggregated together. Um, it works best with low density materials like loose trash or cardboard where you're going to get a lot of compaction um, and can dramatically reduce your frequency of pickups. So in, in some cases you're talking about cutting your pickups to almost a tenth as frequent as you would in, with loose dumpsters and that's a huge efficiency for a lot of programs. Um, another advantage if you're using it for materials like cardboard is you don't have to flatten a box before you put it in the container. Um, the hydraulic ram will essentially do that flattening for you. So that can be a huge advantage for programs. Um, you're also looking at so something that's going to get shifted off-site. So you don't have to worry about emptying anything there. That entire contained load gets shipped from point A to point B. So you don't have to worry about that gust of wind that comes up as you're dumping something in the truck that blows litter all over the place for the grounds crew to have to worry about and yell at you for scattering stuff all over their grounds. Um, it can also reduce blowing around of material. In a lot of cases, uh, Nessa had talked about the, the system we've all used of putting loose cardboard next to a dumpster. That works great until you get a first windstorm and you're chasing that cardboard all up and down the street and people are screaming at you that they've got your cardboard littered all over campus. Um, so this, again, keeps that contained. It keeps 
that litter down. It can help to keep critters out of that where you have critter, uh, critter issues. Um, but it does have some disadvantages. And, and again, these are really issue by issue, campus by campus decisions. So if you're a campus, like a lot of my private schools that have a lot of smaller sites, we've got smaller buildings scattered around a much larger acreage. We don't have as many central generation sites. Compactors tend not to work as well because you're not you're not eliminating the collection option. You're still having to bring stuff back there. Less frequent pickup can be an issue sometimes. You can get odor issues. Um, so you want to make sure you're sizing your compactor box so that you are dumping it frequently enough that that doesn't become a big issue for you. Some sites aren't well designed for access from a roll-off truck. Um, I think some like Nessa's where you've got the smaller hook lift truck can get into a slightly tighter space than the, the larger, more traditional roll-off trucks, but it's still an issue on some campuses getting a truck in. We have a lot of sites at the smaller schools that that won't work. Um, it typically requires a concrete pad and some kind of electrical, um, typically three-phase power. I know you can run a lot of this equipment now on single phase, but what we found is that it typically doesn't work as well and the cost of running it on single phase, we find we end up back at three-phase power most of the time. So getting logistics and that utility to a site can be an issue. And it can pose some aesthetic concerns at a site. If I try putting one of these compactors without sufficient screening um, I, next to a 150-year-old building with a lot of oak trim, it's not going to fly for a lot of my campuses. So you have to be a little careful where you're putting that, who's going to see it, how that affects the overall aesthetic of the campus, because that may be an issue. Um, you also have to think about what kind of compactor you're going to use. There's really two types that you can look at. There's a um, breakaway in which the, the packing ram stays there in the location and only the receiver box goes away. Those are nice because you can get a lot more material into them, but it leaves behind a potential mess. So if there's stuff in that ram chamber that doesn't get into the box before you break it away, you can have that little area where stuff spills out and looks like heck for, for people until you can bring the box back. Um, Another interesting option that's out there now for folks doing collection on walkways is they're making compactors on a much smaller scale. Um, so there, you're starting to see some now. This is actually a solar compactor, and, and it'll actually allow you to eliminate a lot of the collection frequency on individual walkways. So you can, if you have a place where you have very irregular service, um, you, you can compact that material and get a much more re regular pickup frequency. Uh, and pick it up as needed instead of wasting a lot of time chasing around half-empty containers. Cardboard is, for most college campuses, especially an issue. Um, it's the loose material. It, it tends to come in big slugs for a lot of folks. And so oftentimes it requires specialized equipment that you don't see in a residential program. Um, and you're looking at really low density material. You really need something that's going to compact that. And if you don't have a truck or equipment that's going to compact it, it means you've got a person having to compact that material, and they're not going to compact it typically as well. So I'd really encourage people to look at bailing or compacting when they're talking about cardboard collection, whether that's compacted by a piece of equipment or in the truck or however you do it. But I think it's something to really look at. If you are going to use dumpsters, I'd really encourage people to think about those with slots. Um, it basically forces people to flatten that cardboard box before they put it into a container so you don't have those containers that have the big giant unflattened paper towel box at the bottom of it that cuts your weight down tremendously. Um, and I've seen us dump some containers over the years that have got 25, 30 pounds of cardboard in it and the cost to send a truck around to pick up that kind of weight is just sort of ridiculous in terms of efficiency. Um, it also helps to ensure that People are going to remove those packaging materials prior to recycling. If you've got a bin full of styrofoam block or styrofoam peanut, you're not going to fit it through that slot. So it forces people to dump that before they put it in there. Uh, that can be a big issue for a lot of folks. And if you're using a packer truck, hopefully that packer truck is going to do some compacting for you later on. But I'd really encourage people to think about bailing at the generation site um, or compacting at the generation site because you typically pick up an awful lot of efficiency there. If you're, if you're using a baler or a compactor at the site, it doesn't require the boxes to be flattened by staff. They can throw the whole boxes in and let the ram of the packer or the baler crush those for you. It can save dramatically on the number of pickups required at the site, so you're cutting down 
you're typically getting at least a three or four to one compaction rate. Um, and you're talking about picking up bales of stuff that are in the neighborhood of a thousand pounds at a time as opposed to dumpsters which can have sometimes have as little as I said as 25 or 30 pounds in them. Um, it also contains that cardboard so you don't get the blowing and litter that you often do with loose cardboard or if you get a cardboard dumpster that the tops open on. Again we've all had that experience where somebody calls because cardboard boxes are blowing around campus in a heavy windstorm. And if you buy the right size bale or something that's going to get you roughly a thousand pound bale it allows you to ship directly to mills without having to break those bales back open or rebale them. And that can get you a much higher revenue um, than if you have to go through brokers or separate processing facilities. Um, if you do a smaller baler, you can still get some of the operational efficiencies, but you're not going to get as much for the bale because you're probably going to have to break that open and rebale it. But before everyone rushes out and buys a baler, um, there are a few things to consider. Again, typically you're going to need three-phase power. I know you can run them on smaller power, but uh, again, when we've done that, we've typically had issues running it on single phase. Either the cost or the, the effectiveness of that packer doesn't work nearly as well. Um, typically, you're going to have to do some extra safety precautions. Most of the balers have some sort of safety trigger mechanisms on them, um, so it's not going to you're not going to necessarily have an arm crushed in there, but you really want to do a lot of extra safety training to make sure everyone's using that equipment safely, that you've got all the lockout mechanisms that you need to make sure nobody's going to operate that when they're not supervised or not trained on that equipment. It does also require a forklift or a pallet jack to move bales. So if you've got them sighted at a place where you can't easily get a forklift or a pallet jack out, it's going to be an issue emptying those bales out of the baler. Um, so you really do have to think a little bit about a site when you're putting those in. And you do usually need a space to put the bale until it can be brought to market. So um, that can pose its own safety concerns um, or aesthetics concerns on campuses, depending on where you're putting them. Um, you know, Typically, having one next to a building is not going to be an issue, but you start piling up two or three bales next to a building waiting for a pickup. And that can be a real aesthetics problem on some campuses. The other option, if you are talking about putting a processing center of some kind on campus, is bailing at a centralized site. Um, really, to do that, I think you're going to have to do it as a place where you're already talking about a bigger processing center. So if, you were, if you're putting in a centralized facility that already has three-phase power, already has a place to store bales, already has a forklift or a pallet jack, already has some sort of fire suppression, I think putting in centralized balers makes sense. Um, I, I think they make a lot of sense if you have a way to dump containers effectively into the baler without having to rehandle it. I've seen some where you have to actually manually pick up every piece of cardboard that you dump on the floor and load it into a baler. I don't think that adds a lot of efficiency to your system. Um, and again, I'd encourage people to look at bales that are going to be at least 1,000 pound bales so you can ship directly to mills. A, a few things that you have to think about when you're baling. Um, at a centralized site, you still have all the collection costs. So one of the advantages of bailing on site is that you eliminate the collection, um, or at least the frequency of collection of cardboard, which you don't do if you're bailing centralized. And so you still have all that collection costs to factor into the cost of your system. Um, you now have typically added an additional cost to the system in that you have to add, now process that material. and you have to talk about the cost of a facility. So if you're in a warmer climate, you don't necessarily need an enclosed facility. Um, if you're in a colder climate, you're talking about putting in something with a roof, oftentimes things like fire suppression. Um, we, combined with all of that, you could be looking at a multi-million dollar investment. Again, depending on who's collecting material, there are some other options out there. Um, if students are collecting, if folks that are not trained as CDL drivers are collecting, if you need something that's going to not tie up an entire truck, there are some trailer and non-motorized options out there. One that I've seen used in a number of places, we used them at um, Sacramento State. I've known Rice University, which is one of those pictures, has used them. Um, it's essentially a towable dumpster. So somebody's welded front load dumpster pockets essentially onto a trailer. Um, when those are dumped, they're typically used to tow around, pick up smaller containers around campus. They can be brought back to a centralized facility yard and dumped by a front load truck. Um, typically, somebody is part of a larger route. 
so you've got a waste hauler coming in as part of a larger route to, to dump those for you. Um, what I like about those is if you are going to use trailers, they tend to have axles and wheels that allow you to take them over slightly rougher terrain, um, which can be an issue, and I'll show that in a couple of the later dumps or later trailers. Um, but they're difficult to leave at sites. As you see where it's sitting on the ground, the tongue of that trailer sits way out. Um, it's a big trip hazard if you leave it off on site somewhere. They don't move very well by hand, so if you have to move them by hand to get them back to where you can hook them up onto a truck or get them to dump, they can be a real bear to move around. Um, another option is basically taking the idea of a truck and, and putting it on a trailer. This is a nice option for smaller collections, for more specialized collections. Um, it, it's a more traditional dump trailer design, oftentimes enclosed. Protainer makes that top bin. Um, and there's a number of other ones involved, uh, available. If you look through a lot of grounds equipment type catalogs, you'll find some of those dump trailers. You can get them that dump hydraulically, which is nice. There's a small hydraulic power mechanism in that front box that you see on the trailer. It allows you to dump down into anywhere you've got grade separation. So you can use it a lot like a dump truck. The disadvantage of that is it typically has a longer footprint. So it's a little tougher to maneuver in some areas. If you've got folks that aren't particularly good about backing up a trailer, it can really be a problem for people. Um, and backing up a trailer when you've got students that have never backed a trailer before can sometimes be an interesting, interesting exercise to watch. So, um, you know, you definitely want to think about where you're going to bring those and how you're going to maneuver them around. One last option that I've used in a couple of places. Um, Layola Marymount down in LA was the first place I ever saw those, so I'll give a shout out to them for introducing me to them. It's basically a towable dumpster. So it looks like a regular four-yard dumpster with a fold-down trailer hitch on it, um, typically some kind of pneumatic caster on the bottom. And it really lets you put those containers somewhere you put a regular dumpster um, and then wheel them around a facilities yard or a small enclosed campus in whatever kind of small gator or electric cart. Uh, we've towed them with gem carts, um, Taylor Dunn's gator carts, any of those kinds of smaller things. A pickup truck would work just as well. And it dumps very, very well. Um, in, in our case, we actually used a rotating head forklift to dump them into the, the baler. The problem is you really can't use them in a northern climate. Those casters are typically very, very small. They're not going to go through snow. Um, and, and so if you're in a colder climate where you're expecting snow, it, it's really not a good option. It's also not something if you're towing them far or at, a farther, or at a faster speed. So they're really designed for about five miles an hour on a closed campus that's perfectly flat. So if you've got potholes, if you've got speed bumps, um, we had a lot of the speed control dots. So the, the speed control dots that we used, as, uh, you see them as rumble strips on some highways, they shredded these casters. Um, we couldn't keep casters on those containers towing them any farther than our facilities yard. Um, and they really, really didn't work well for us on the perimeter roads where we had those speed control strips because those just destroyed the caster. And we'd see people trying to tow them into the recycling site where the, the caster was completely gone and the bottom of the cart was sparking as it was driving down the road. Um, so you really want to save this for some place where you've got an enclosed facility. If you're thinking about doing something at um, an enclosed stadium within a facilities yard, some place like that where you've got a nice controlled area, I think they'd work fairly well. Um, and then what is increasingly popular as an option with some of the sustainability folks is the non-motorized option. Um, I think it's a niche option, but I think it's a very interesting niche option for a lot of places. What we're seeing is that we can get those non-motorized carts into some places we can't get a larger truck. Um, so that top picture is actually from a um, co-op that we have here in our local town that actually does non-motorized collection for a lot of businesses and a lot of individual residents. And what's phenomenal is they can get those bikes into places you could never get a front loader or even a rear load truck. So they're able to offer services to businesses that would never normally be participating. Um, I think you can use a similar model on a college campus to get into some of the tighter pickup locations that you wouldn't ever normally think about putting a collection system. So it's definitely an option. Um, it works out fairly well for picking up places like sidewalk bins where you don't necessarily want a truck driving down there at full speeds, interacting with pedestrians. It's something that can be readily done by students. 
the problems that you really run into is you're not getting much per trip. So if you're going far distances between pickup and where you're going to dump it, you lose a lot of efficiency because you're often only picking up 50 to 100 pounds. Um, and you really have to think about securing that load, which student drivers aren't necessarily always really good about securing stuff. So when you've got smaller closed boxes, bungee corded down, um, that tends to work very well. If you've got loose stuff hanging off the top of a bin as somebody loads it into the cart, oftentimes you've got stuff blowing all over the place. And that's really a problem um, on a lot of campuses, and I think a limitation of this system. So hopefully that gives folks a little bit of an overview. Um, and some of these, and hopefully we'll have some questions at the end. But let me turn that back over to BJ. Thanks, Roger. That was quite a uh, a wide display of, of types of equipment. And I have to say on the efficiency, I guess it depends on what you consider efficiency. If I could get my calories burned while uh, picking up recyclables, I'd consider that efficient in some way. So our next speaker is Roger Gazowski. Oh, sorry, Carrie Sanford carries with Resource Recycling Systems, and let's see, he was a co-founder of Resource Recycling Systems, has specialized in equipment design, specification, integration, installation, and maintenance for both the solid waste and energy fields for over 25 years. He's been designing and specifying recycling facilities since 1981, and has contributed, contributed to the design and construction of more than 20 MRFs from Michigan to South Korea. Having led many through schools through this decision-making process as to whether to commingle materials or keep them separate based on value, market, locations. Carrie's going to walk us through the questions that drive university processing decisions and um, product marketing. Okay, Carrie? Um, we'll uh, go through this uh, a little bit at a time. I want to give some general uh, guidelines into um, processing approaches. Uh, we'll start in with a uh, quick description of what intermediate processing is, which uh, in, at least in my opinion and for the sake of this discussion is uh, to sort materials to marketable grades and remove debris and then package for efficient handling and shipping. And um, some people, when they talk about processing, are actually talking about what happens at the mills uh, where the materials are converted back into new products. Uh, I'm just referring to what I call intermediate processing that potentially could happen on campus or at a MRF. The basic uh, processing facility needs are a receiving or tipping area, a sort line if you're commingling materials and need to separate them. A baler, if you have enough materials to justify that. Otherwise, maybe you're putting materials in boxes or compacting material. Storage, if you're needing to accumulate truckloads in larger facilities, you want to ship in full semi-loads to get the best price. If you are collecting 10 different materials, then you need to be able to house most of 10 truckloads on site. Uh, a loading dock. Uh, it, most of the time, if you are bailing, you're going to ship bales out, if not in a semi, in a van body truck where you have to load those bales into the truck. And then material handling equipment is usually uh, in a larger facility, you'll have a forklift, some kind of loader. In a smaller facility, you may be able to make do with just a pallet jack. If you are um, trying to figure out what kind of resources you need to put a facility in place, ultimately you need some space. This might be an existing building somewhere uh, in a southern location, especially in the southwest. It potentially could be outside uh, uh, or at least just a roof. If you are in um, a northern climate, you probably need four walls and a roof and maybe some heat. Uh, and this varies a lot depending on where you are in the country, and, and uh, as Roger was saying, the aesthetics may be important as well. Uh, your capital investment, if you're just basically working out of a shed and maybe have a baler and pallet jack or forklift, you're in the tens of thousands 
of dollars or less if you are building a facility that's able to sort single stream with some mechanization you're many millions of dollars and and so uh, there's an appropriateness of the technology according to what you're trying to do you will need utilities uh, in most situations you will need heat light and electrical power however um, the uh, when I was coordinating Recycle Ann Arbor in its infancy, we collected uh, recyclables from the University of Michigan. And we arranged with the university to uh, use a storage trailer they had in their plant department yard. We would back our truck up to that uh, trailer, unload materials into Gaylord boxes in that trailer, and when we filled about six Gaylord boxes, we would drag those boxes onto our truck and haul them to market. It was uh, not what you'd call a sophisticated processing facility, but it was what we needed at the time to get by. Staffing uh, can be basically one person who's running the whole show in a small operation to sort dual stream or single stream in a larger facility, you may be talking 10, 20, even 30 people. Um, larger facilities are even more. So now we're starting to get into the, the who part. Um, you can process your own, or you could have somebody else process for you. Uh, so a, uh, a comprehensive program will probably recall, re, excuse me, it requires some of each of the following. You collect pre-sorted and deliver to the buyer. This often happens with uh, corrugated on small and, and medium-sized campuses. Uh, you collect and deliver to an off-campus, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, you collect and deliver to an off-campus processor. So if you are collecting uh, single stream or dual stream, but don't have your own processing capability, you would take that to uh, a local MRF. Uh, or you could collect and process at an on-campus facility. And uh, with a number of materials, especially when you get into universal waste and um, odd recyclables such as toner cartridges, uh, there's, there's usually some of this taking place. I'm suggesting you consider off-campus processing whenever you can. And the reason for this is a, a an existing uh, large volume processor can justify large capital equipment investments for efficient sorting, and they can have bailing equipment that works very efficiently. Uh, large MRFs may also allow you to commingle more materials than you can efficiently sort in an on-campus facility, uh, reducing your collection costs. Uh, generally, commingling is good if um, there's a low-cost way to process the materials after they're collected. The best options will achieve desired recovery targets for future growth. So. And, or, I'm sorry, and allow for future growth. The um, uh, target uh, that you have will depend on what materials you're collecting and how much volume you are looking to collect down the road. You also want to maintain your flexibility because your, your waste stream will change over time and um, so will your recovery targets and the end markets for the materials. The, uh, the biggest issue that uh, we face when we are working with clients is trying to assess true cost when comparing different uh, uh, system options. The, the, um, the number we look for is basically the lowest net system cost that includes, and this is the important part, 
all related administration, education, promotion, collection, and processing costs over a wide range of market conditions. And drawing these numbers out uh, from a university where things are buried in the uh, general fund or shared by departments uh, tends to be uh, a fairly challenging process and usually involves getting uh, several levels of administration involved in the discussion. If you're shipping to off-campus facility, you want to know that the site you're going to is close enough to be cost effective. The only way that you can really be sure of this is to model the system cost of your various options. So one of the things that we have learned in modeling a number of small uh, systems and also by actually looking at costs of uh, small programs, when you put all of the costs in, we often see uh, processing costs that are higher than $100 per ton and have seen as high as $300 per ton. And this is not sustainable when you are looking at uh, a program that's growing and, and you're looking at costs that are going up as the recycling increases, which is you really want the recycling program to be showing a net savings over uh, the waste program that's already in place. Uh, some campus situations may justify shipping commingled material over 100 miles to a processing facility. Uh, this is especially true with uh, single stream, and I will get into that a little bit more. Uh, the um, distance, again, depends on uh, how well you can pack the material for shipping and what your alternatives are. To use an off-campus processor, you need to figure out how you're going to deliver the materials to the processor. If it's a nearby facility, you can generally uh, take your collection vehicle directly to that facility and tip on their tipping floor. Uh, if you are shipping to a longer distance, you may be needing to um, pack materials in a compactor or use a transfer station. Or maybe if you're a really small operation, you're doing everything in Gaylord boxes, and you just need a loading dock to load those out. The uh, um, processing collection technologies uh, that I'm going to refer to here are based on the level of commingling. So simple commingling means simple sorting. Uh, typically, this is. Uh, in the simplest situation, you take steel cans and you mix them in with, uh, say, plastic bottles. You can run that across a magnet and pull out the steel cans. It makes for real simple sorting, but you eliminate one collection container. As you get more complex, you mix in more bottles and cans. Uh, you have a fiber stream where you combine the two and end up with single stream. So for that, the sake of this discussion, single stream is defined as all fiber and bottles and cans combined into one container at collection. Dual stream, all fiber is in one container, all bottles and cans in another at collection. And then multi-sort is where you have multiple containers uh, put out by residents or in uh, the early curbside multi-sort, uh, people put everything out in one bin and it was sorted into multiple bins on the truck. Uh, the limitations of these will uh, become apparent as we go a little bit further here. Uh, I'm doing uh, pros and cons of each of these. The single stream simplifies collection and reduces cost for collection of most materials. Uh, this is only true if you have a processor who can accept the material. Uh, but assuming you have a processor, you can collect everything in one container, ship it to the uh, end uh, processor, in this case, the uh, MRF that, as I said before, might be 100 miles away. Uh, 
most single stream facilities accept a wide range of recyclables, and this has been increasing gradually over the years. Um, labor efficiency of single stream processing is at least equal to dual stream, even with more complex sorting because of the mechanical separation capabilities that have been added. Now, many recent facilities produce very high quality products. Uh, I've been in uh, a number of single stream facilities recently that are producing better quality uh, newspaper than their dual stream counterparts. Uh, transport, again, if you need to go long distance, you can pack it all in, in one box or a transfer trailer and haul it a long distance. And, and uh, the private haulers are actually doing this with municipalities where they are going over 100 miles to processing facilities at this point. Um, the con side of single stream is the the primary issue is the investment cost required to build an efficient facility. It's not really practical to do for less than about 15,000 tons per year with any level of mechanization. And recent facilities, a lot of them are, are targeted at 30,000 for a single shift or as much as 200,000 tons per year in a, through one of these facilities. And that means that you have to consolidate materials from a large area to make them work. Um, from the uh, university's point of view, uh, you're looking at the revenue you can get for the materials that you send to these facilities. They're going to charge you for processing. Most of them will do revenue sharing on the value of materials. If the facility is not set up to recover your higher value materials, as higher grade products, for example, your high grade papers grades, if they end up in with the newspaper or in with the mixed paper, they're not selling for $300 a ton, they're selling for $100 a ton maybe. And, and so the revenue that they are willing to share with you is quite a bit less. Uh, glass is uh, usually broken and sold as mixed uh, collet, reducing the value compared to sorted collet. But uh, one of the things that has been learned with single stream facilities is that if you try to pass whole bottles through the facility, you end up with broken glass in most of the products. So this has mostly been resolved by pulling the glass out at the front end of the processing. There are more and more optical glass sorting facilities being built to, again, recover that material for making new glass products. But um, a lot of it does not get recycled back into bottles at this point. Uh, some of the older facilities still have problems with the glass. And the last uh, downside piece here is that you have limited control over what can be accepted by the university uh, because that is determined by the processor and not you. And dual stream, you have a, a simpler, lower cost collection um, with then with multi-sort, uh, you can uh, be scaled down to a relatively small facility that can be built on most campuses. Uh, and they accept a wide range of recyclables and can handle source sorted fiber well without having to mix it in with other materials as long as you have a place to set it aside on the tipping floor. Uh, and they can transport or transport to distant processors is still possible but you have to either have a divided uh, transfer, transport vehicle or you have to ship alternate loads from some form of uh, transfer station. And you get good uh, product quality from most facilities. Um, again, it has a fairly high uh, process capital cost, but much less than single stream. Uh, revenue sharing, again, may have the same issues as with single stream unless the processor is willing to uh, set your um, higher grade materials aside as they are delivered separately. And again, you have limited control over what can be accepted uh, from your end of it. Uh, the cost effective transport distance is about half of that 
as per single street. And looks like I need to pick up my speed here a little bit. So uh, simple uh, or multi-sort is very simple to implement. Um, you just need a lot of containers. Uh, your processing costs are minimal, either bailing or boxing. And you can operate with uh, very small volumes. Uh, the disadvantage is as the number of material increase, collection gets quite complicated, requires a lot of compartments on your truck, and at some point it just becomes impractical. And collection costs are high, and collection and labor, or collection labor and transport are intensive. Uh, and requires, as I said before, many containers. Uh, I'm going to now lead through uh, four example programs here. I have more photos of some than others, uh, and you'll see why as we go through them. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The, the first one is the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan combined um, it's recyclables with the city of Ann Arbor, and a dual stream MRF was built back in the early 90s uh, that was recently converted to a single stream facility. Uh, this is an example of good cooperation between a municipality and a university. Uh, the second one is Michigan State University. They built their own MRF after trying for at least 10 years to work with the city of Lansing on a joint facility. Uh, and it's an example of one of the more sophisticated MRFs ever built by a university. The third one is uh, Miami University of Ohio, and uh, this is a, a um, I guess you'd call it a, a low-level MRF that's capable of, of processing dual stream or various commingled streams. And then the last one is Ohio University, and I will explain that one more as we get there. This is the single stream MRF that uh, the city of Ann Arbor owns. It is operated by FCR as a contractor. And uh, University of Michigan brings all of their materials to, that is all of the materials that this facility accepts to this facility. Uh, it takes or sorts out approximately 25 uh, different grades of materials. Uh, and it is highly mechanized, and the facility is currently processing about 250 tons a day. Michigan State University built this uh, facility. It is combined with their uh, resale center, uh, which handles their surplus materials and equipment. Uh, this is a conceptual layout of the facility as it was conceived. Uh, and I'm going to try to point to things here. Uh, we have three large doors where trucks can back in and tip onto the floor. We have these movable bunker blocks that were set up to um, allow the uh, uh, placement of material for um, each of the um, uh, grades for um, the operation of the facility as uh, the um, based on the the uh, delivery schedule and then these materials could be metered to uh, this is the feed for the sort line and the sort elevated sort line up here where materials are sorted into uh, large bunkers below and then finally pushed up onto the baler, uh, feed conveyor into the baler, baled, bales are stacked, and eventually loaded out at the uh, loading docks to uh, semis ready to go to the various markets. In addition to that, the facility includes uh, space for storing carts, a lockable space for um, uh, secure data storage, a uh, a compactor for transfer of materials, and a cart wash station. The, the tipping floor is quite large. Uh, trucks can back in, unload, and um, head out within a few minutes. There's a scale around the backside of the building so they can keep track of 
everything that comes in and out of the building. The uh, Using a skid steer loader, they can meter materials onto the uh, baler feed conveyor or onto the sort line. In this case, the, uh, they are making test bales with the baler uh, as the facility was being commissioned. Here you can see the elevated sort line and the conveyor feeding it. The skid steer loader is in the process of pushing out the corrugated cardboard from one of the storage bunkers underneath. On the uh, left, you'll see a mixed fiber stream that's going up to the sort line. On the right, standing up top, uh, this is event recycling, uh, bottles from uh, a sports event. These are um, basically, they are just pulling out the, any residue items so that this material can be baled as a saleable product. And then here's the baler. This is a 2-ram Harris Badger baler. It uh, will bale just about anything you can put into it and is uh, a fairly efficient way to uh, bale a wide range of materials. I'll talk a little bit more about balers at the end, but uh, you'll see that the, the discharge door on this is closed right now. Uh, that allows you to bale loose things like plastic bottles without having a bale sitting out here to hold the material inside the bale chamber. And the last item in, in their um, processing facility that I'm going to discuss is this uh, uh, compactor. And this thing is it sits to one side of the uh, facility. It, what it allows is for mixed bottles and cans uh, to be collected and packed into this container and shipped to a two-stream processing facility to process that stream. Or further down the road, if uh, the university decides that uh, sorting um, residential uh, stream from the, uh, the housing is not efficient on campus, they can, and the, the economics makes sense, they can pack single stream from housing units in here and ship this to a single stream facility for processing. Uh, using the rest of the facility to process materials that uh, do not make sense to handle that way. Uh, sorry, this one's a little blurry, but um, this is Miami University of Ohio. About uh, 10 years ago, the uh, university decided they needed a more efficient way to sort materials than uh, from Gaylord to Gaylord and uh, the simple conveyor uh, sort that they had before that where they had to scoop materials up onto the feed conveyor and um, th this this was the replacement system. It still uh, it, well, it involved two conveyors, one with a hopper in the floor where materials could be pushed in. Uh, materials are elevated to the upper conveyor where people stand either side uh, able to sort uh, materials either into the chutes and drop into Gaylord boxes below, or they could throw over the rail behind them into other boxes, or lastly they could have uh, uh, like garbage cans on the deck that they could sort uh, uh, contaminant materials into or small quantity materials into. Hey, Carrie. Carrie. This is what the you know, yeah. I'm going to interrupt a little bit because we're running a little short on time. It's about 20 after, and I wanted to be sure that we had time for some questions and discussion between the panelists. So I hate to do that because we've got some great slides. They will be available on the um, Kirk website. Um, there are more slides for Carrie's presentation that have uh, Miami University and Baylor's. On. So is it all right if I interrupt and ask all the panels yeah, to come fine. panels to come back on? Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Is everybody on with me? Yep. 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 Good. Well, um, I'm going to ask Caitlin to help us with some of the questions that came through. But 
some that I saw that I wanted to run through real quick. One, Carrie, you had a question about um, horizontal balers. Can you give anyone an idea of how much volume they need to justify a horizontal baler? Um, let me zip up to that photo. Um, well, I went right past it. Okay. Can't seem to hit it. Okay. Well, we'll uh, go to the horizontal baler here and Ed Newman slides into every presentation, doesn't he? Yes. The the uh, uh, the horizontal baler uh, is not well. The problem with the horizontal baler is the starting cost on one is about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And and so the reason you go to horizontal baler is because you can't do it with something else. Okay. So the the um, uh, most things can be bailed with with a. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is a two ram horizontal baler, and the this is our, our three different versions of single ram horizontal balers. The the two ram is the one that starts at about two hundred thousand dollars. These other ones um, are all over the map depending on the size of them, and Anybody who has enough volume that uh, you can't keep up with a single uh, vertical baler should be starting to think about a, a horizontal if you ha are baling in a central facility. And, and it's probably about the best answer I can give. OK, great. And I wanted to mention the fact that there were a lot of questions that came in about um, how you get materials out of the building. Nessa's answered a few of those. Um, hang on one second. Nessa's answered a few of those on the chat question. And I do want to point out that for this session, we were focusing on once the materials, I guess, pretty much get outside of the building. But I think that's a great topic for another webinar. And I don't think we have enough question, time right now to fully address the how you get housekeeping or your staff involved in getting the materials out, um, unless any of the speakers have anything quickly to say about that. Just the one quick thing I'd throw in there um, is I really like having a clean system where housekeeping handles the collection inside the building, gets it to a consolidation point, and then your collection crew, whether it's in-house or contracted out, handles it from there. Because that way they're not tracking dirt into something. Housekeeping's just cleaned. Um, I I've seen a lot of battles go back and forth when you've got collection staff going into buildings. So I think we can do more later, but that would be the one thing I'd mention now. NASA, did you have anything to add? The only thing I'll add to that is um, I would agree housekeeping is already in the building. They have um, basically your labor pool is already there. If you have your own staff, which I do, a dedicated indoor collections crew that goes only inside buildings and pulls the materials out, the problem is is that crew is never going to be the right size. Basically, as you have renovations in buildings, new activities, you know, new buildings coming online, you're going to have to continually grow that staff where their housekeepers are already in the buildings. And that is really, you know, one of the functions that they can provide that and you can convince the housekeeping to be on board with the recycling program. It's more beneficial that they do the collections inside the building. I think we'll have a lot of debate on that topic over recycle in the coming weeks. Um, <laughs> yes. But I think that I appreciate both of your perspectives, and I think that um, that is probably the way a lot of programs are going. It would be an interesting poll to get. I think particularly with the budget cuts so many universities are facing, that's, and then that's kind of the position we we're in. It's, it's leading towards that due to budget cuts. Great. Thanks. Caitlin, are there any other questions, or do you think it's time to wrap up? Hold on one second. Let me. Another question we had while she's doing that real quick is where would be a good place to get information on this kind of equipment? Cost, I think there were some questions that came in, Nessa, about the uh, capacity of the swap loader, the cost, and just a general question that said, what's a good place to get started? And my answer to that was to ask your peers um, what, what they're using, what's working, find a school that's similar to you, and then get in touch with vendors. But we've borrowed specifications from NASA and other schools that we found something that's working. We like it in, in progress, like in action already, and so we just ask if we can 
kind of tailgate on what they're doing. Yeah, and I can't encourage enough pirating what other schools have successfully done and yeah, you know, just look at it and see what's worked for them and also why it's worked. You know, just make sure that it's going to work for your parameters, but copying as much of what somebody else has done keeps you from having to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Right. Caitlin? Uh, sure, there was another question. Um, how do you get housekeeping to comply with recycling programs and get to the third step of the recycling program? Yeah, I think we talked about that one a little bit. Is there anything else to add on that? I mean, specifically, how you get housekeeping to comply is, is um, I think, a very open-ended question, one that might take more time than we have. But is there anything else to add on that one? Yeah, only that it's probably going to take more time than we have. But if somebody <laughs> wants to contact me directly, I'd be glad to share with them a couple of success stories. Yeah, that's great. And the other thing I um, I noticed, and I'm glad you touched on it, Carrie, while you were talking, is the value of materials, especially when we're using outside processors. Um, Nessa, I don't know if any of you guys, panelists, are willing to comment. If you, you don't have to say how much or anything, but are you getting a revenue share from the MRF that you work with? Um, here at NC State University, we do share revenue with the MRF and um, also revenue from scrap metal sales, so we have an annual income of approximately $70,000 for recycled material sales. And the size of your school? Um, that I cannot answer at the moment. I forget. It changes oh, so much. Somewhere around 30,000 Pro students? Probably around, th I think it's about 37,000 students, and then when you add in all faculty and staff and everything, it's um, about 45, 48,000. Okay. And Roger, your schools are usually on the smaller scale, right? Yeah, the, within the five colleges, we're talking schools that are anywhere from about 1,500 to 3,000 students. Um, Sac State was about 28,000. UMass is somewhere in that range between 25 and 30. Great. Well, I, again, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank our speakers so much for participating in this and putting the time and energy into your presentations and thinking about this topic. It's, it's very, very helpful and very much appreciated, I'm sure, by all the participants that are on the other end of these computer screens. And I also want to thank Keep America Beautiful and Alcoa for making the webinar series possible. And remind you all that the next webinar will take place on June 2nd. The top topic will be social marketing and behavior change. And again, we'll be posting the recording of today's webinar on the CARC website in the coming week. So you can find archives of past webinar recordings in addition um, covering topics such as campus composting and residence hall move out, which is a very timely subject right now. So thank you all to, um, for the participants and for the people, for the speakers and the participants. It's very, very great to have you all here interacting on this subject. So thanks. Thanks, Caitlin.